Welcome everybody to the IEA Bioenergy webinar series hosted by the Canadian Institute of Forestry. My name is Ronnie Huang and I will be kicking off today's session. Today is December 1st, 2017 and the title of today's webinar is The Hotspots of the Global Wood Pellet Industry and Trade of 2017. We are very pleased to have the task leader of IEA Bioenergy Task 40, Martin Junger, who will be the moderator of today's session. To start things off, Professor and Dr. Martin Junginger holds the Chair of Bio-Based Economy at the Copernicus Institute, Utrecht University, and works amongst others on sustainable biomass production, supply chains, conversion, and end use for energy and materials, which he has published over 75 scientific articles on. Furthermore, he is the task leader of IEA Bioenergy Task 40 on sustainable biomass markets and international trade to support the bio-based economy. In this frame, he is also the project leader of an IEA Bioenergy Intertask project on measuring, governing, and gaining support for sustainable bioenergy supply chains. With that, I will pass it along to Martin to start off the presentation. Thank you very much, Roni, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar on the hotspots of the global wood pellet industry and trade 2017. As Ronnie already explained, this uh, webinar is brought to you also by IA Bioenergy Task 40. We are a working group under the IA Bioenergy program, and we have currently about 10 members, including Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Sweden, the US, and UK. And our working group, uh, as the title already says, aims to support the bio-based economy in the development of international bioenergy markets and international trade. So we work regularly on market studies. We try to support international trade by informing market players about ongoing developments, such as regulation, sustainability constraints. We also look at international trade flows, uh, try to, to set up statistics specifically for commodities which are not so often so transparent, like waste uh, uh, wood, and we also uh, do studies, for example, on uh, logistic chains, how to optimize them, what kind of effect uh, different new commodities like uh, torrefaction can play. And so today fits into this scope very well. Today we're going to present uh, a study on the international wood pellet markets. Um, and so this study uh, covers a number of aspects. Today, I, after the introduction, Daniela Train will first of all give a 10-minute overview of the global view of hotspots, trade, and major issues around uh, wood pellets. We will then zoom in uh, on the North American markets, uh, the main large exporters of today's global wood pellet trade, after which we will then focus on Europe and uh, the center of consumption of wood pellets. Uh, we will then spend some short time about the ongoing development of sustainability legislation and criteria for wood pellets. Uh, and we will finish the presentations with a short uh, outlook on prospects of torrefaction and advantages. We will then have about half an hour time for question and answering session, which will be moderated by myself. And then ultimately, Daniela Train will uh, close off the webinar with a uh, short summary. And we aim to finalize the webinar around 5 o'clock CET. But that can also be 5 or 10 minutes later than that. So maybe a few words about the study that we published. This is a study which was actually uh, published already in July 2017. However, uh, as that was in the European and the North American summer, we decided to give it a bit more publicity by organizing this webinar again. Um, the study was a truly uh, all-task effort, so we have contributions from all members of Task 40, um, but we also have contributions, for example, from Brazil, from uh, Suani uh, Coelho and uh, her colleagues but also from uh, Canada, from Gordon Murray. Uh, I want to emphasize that the study was led uh, very efficiently by Daniela Train and their colleagues David uh, and, and Kai. Um, and so they are taking the lead and they will also present today. If you want to read the full study, it is really a very comprehensive piece of work um, and it can be downloaded uh, at the link below, so on task40.iabioenergy.com. Um, and if you don't want to read more than 150 pages, you will also to be able to download a short two-page summary of this study, which will give you the highlights. And obviously, you can follow today's uh, webinar, which will give you the highlights as well. Now, about the authors, I will briefly introduce all the presenters at once. The first speaker of today is Professor Daniela Train, and she is head of the Department of Bioenergy System Research at the German Biomass Research Center in Leipzig. She's 
She is experienced in the assessment of bioenergy from resources to integrated use in future energy systems with high share of renewables, so-called smart bioenergy systems. She also holds the chair of bioenergy systems at the University of Leipzig. After her, her colleague Kai Schaubach is an experienced project manager also working at the German Biomass Research Center. He has led a number of projects on international multi-million euro scale projects, and he has specialized in it in his more than 10 years of work experience in market analysis, including potentials, stakeholders, legal framework processes and prices, business cases, and the economic feasibility of various bioenergy technologies, for example, biogas plants, or sea and steam turbines and torrefaction, as well as the market integration of bioenergy. He is internationally active, especially in South America and Asia. Next, Dr. Fabian Schipfer will present. He is working since 2012 for the Energy Economics Group of the University of Technology in Vienna with the focus on market introduction and market diffusion of renewable energy technologies, bioenergy technologies, and their respective commodities. And within IA Bioenergy Task 40, he is representing Austria. After myself, as I was already presented uh, or introduced by Ronnie, uh, Michael Wild uh, will uh, finalize today's presentation. He is an economist and engineer by education is active in renewable energies for practically his entire 26 years of professional career. And for the last 10 years, he has taken a leading position in torrefaction technology development, forming also a consortium with Andre Zagé. Since 2012, he has helped setting up the International Biomass Torrefaction Council, IBTC, together with IBM, whose members elected him as president. He is currently active in project development and implementation and working with producers and trading houses in trading of wood pellets and torrified biomasses all over the world. With that short introduction, I would like to hand over to Daniela to give the global overview. Thank you very much, Martin. We, I will give you now a short global overview on the hotspot trade and major issues, which we will then uh, discuss more in detail by Kai and Fabian. Just going in, in the center of the question, uh, the wood pellet market is a market dealing with defined solid biofuels. Wood pellets are so, fa so far mainly from virgin biomass, like residues from wood processing uh, industry, but also from forest wood, and this market is continuously growing. Uh, if you look back, we had in 2006 about 6 to 7 million tons of global wood production. This has increased to about 14, 15 million tons in 2010 and uh, is, uh, ends up in 2015, 16 to 26 million tons. So a strong increase can be seen here. And uh, what we tried to do in our study is to uh, give an overview on the uh, activities of several countries. How, how do they produce wood pellets? What kind of pellets they use? And uh, also what are the frame conditions for produ production and consumption? Uh, bringing all this information together, we of, of course uh, uh, tried to, to develop timelines between uh, 2010 and 2015-16, but we will here and today only show you the actual situation. And this is, uh, let's say, the global picture about the production. And first of all, it's clear that we have uh, some global uh, wood pellet regions. These are the North Americas, Europe with many and uh, various activities, and then some activities in Asia too. If you look at this picture, you see that we, we consider between two kinds of markets for application. In blue, this is the residential sector, and in green, this is the industrial sector. And the consumption is also different between the countries, but also different within Europe. Relevant uh, use of wood pellets with regard 
to the uh, overall energy demand is also shown in this graphic. You see the different browns of the countries, and this this shows the total primary energy. Uh, supply share. So in some regions and some countries there is already a small uh, but increasing share from wood pellets to the overall energy demand. This is for example through for um, Belgium, for United Kingdom, Sweden and Denmark and so these are also quite relevant countries. You, if you look at the, on the left hand side, you see a better uh, uh, picture of Europe and also here it comes out that you have some and uh, countries with a very high consumption, uh, but you also have here, like especially outside of Europe, countries with a strong export. These are the red bars of the countries and uh, within the European Union, especially the eastern countries like Latvia, Estonia, uh, but also Hungary or Czech, Czech, Czech Republic are more exporting pellet countries than using them themselves. We will go, uh, we will have a deeper look into the different countries soon, but uh, last but not least I would like to mention there are some activities also in Asia uh, with regard to uh, pellet demand and consumption in South Korea, in Japan and some provisions for example in Vietnam or China and those uh, bars might look not so big at the moment but they have the strongest dynamics uh, or had the strong strongest dynamics during the last five years. Maybe one uh, final word to the question what does it mean residential sector and industrial sector. Uh, residential sector, these are mainly pellets used in heating systems, small scale systems for the provision of heat and industrial sector is typically the use of pellets in existing coal power plants in so called coal firing applications. If we have a, a deeper look into the countries, we have in some considered uh, about 40 countries, you find them all here listed and what we uh, tried, uh, what we used as a, as a uh, system is to show the national values on the volumes on the right hand side and those national volumes uh, mean domestic supply and import to cover the consumption. So you see the biggest, uh, the big consumption countries are United Kingdom, also the US is a relevant consumption country, Denmark, Italy, Germany, Sweden, South Korea, etc., etc. On the left hand side you see the uh, uh, quantities of export and here the US is uh, uh, leading followed by Canada, Latvia, Vietnam and uh, also Russia and there are countries mainly exporting, countries mainly importing and some of the countries also uh, do both uh, using pellets and export them. Uh, for example, this is uh, relevant for Germany or also Austria. And behind these different d dynamics uh, stand different kind of policy frame conditions. If we try to have uh, or, or to, to focus on the hotspots, we see mainly Europe and the North America as the two hotspots. Europe with 75% of the global consumption, more than 50% still of the global production. And as I mentioned already here, both uh, is, uh, is done, we use pellets for heat generation in res residential systems, this is still the major part, and also for electricity provision in large scale power plants, this is about one third. 
in comparison to not uh, America, U the US and Canada do mainly produce uh, pellets, 75% of the global production, about one uh, tenth of the global consumption, and this consumption is so far mostly heat, so we don't find any co-firing co there. We have the rising uh, uh, countries like Japan, South Korea, and China as a country uh, where it was very difficult to get data, so we call them the great unknown. And there's a very specific relation between the U.S. and the United Kingdom. U.S. is the large, largest global consumer with more than 6 million tons in 2015, what equals uh, one quarter of the global demand. And uh, also with a country with, with, almost, with almost no domestic production. On the other hand, the U.S. are the largest producer and uh, for the time being more than half the uh, U.K. pellets are imported from the U.S. and vice versa, the U.S. export more than 80 percent to the U.K. So this is a special relation, and you see this special relation also quite clearly. If you look at the trade flows, it is the most important trade flow, um, and the let's say the driver behind is uh, the climate policy uh, approach of the UK. We have other smaller trade flows, namely from Russia, Russia and under other CIS to EU28 and some trade flows to Asia. If we uh, discuss now what are the drivers and barriers for the developing of the market, I've mentioned already the regulatory framework conditions are quite relevant with regard to the question how uh, different countries want to fulfill their climate gas reduction targets and co-firing of woody biomass is one option for this climate gas reduction. Additionally, we have a strong debate about sustainability along the value chain. We will hear more about this in the end of this webinar from Martin. And then uh, one additional question is, even if the market has been developed strongly during the last 10 years, the transformation into a global commodity is still in a uh, not uh, c complete mature stage. And for the future, we also should be aware that new technologies are developed, for example, torrefaction, which will be presented by Michael in the end. And we also uh, expect demand from new markets, for example, uh, pr production of materials and not only energy from renewables. So we, with this very short overview, of the study in general. Maybe let me finally mention we have in this study, it's a very uh, long study with more than 200 pages, mainly very detailed information about, about all the 14, 40 different countries. So it, is, uh, it, it might be helpful for more questions in detail. But today, and now we go for the hotspots, and we, I would like to hand over to Kai to discuss the North American market. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela, uh, for, for this introduction. And I would, I would also like to thank uh, the authors Patrick uh, Lamers, Gordon Murray, and uh, Richard Hess which have contributed all the data and background information for uh, the North American um, countries. So uh, with this uh, slide, I would like to show you again the distribution uh, which we have um, globally. So uh, the U28 actually is the largest uh, pellet producer, but this is a community of different countries. We look at North America, uh, we have two countries with a share of 35% of glo global pellet production, which is split 
uh, into the U.S. as the largest producer actually worldwide with 28% uh, of uh, global production. So this is really um, the, let's say, heavyweight champion in, in the production. And as Daniela also showed, uh, they are the largest exporter. Uh, I want to pick up on this uh, slide, uh, this graph, where you can see uh, the, the actual distribution. So. Um, in total, uh, you can see the graph for the United States in blue, which equals the total total production. So we have this blue line of export and this blue line here um, in domestic consumption. So um, the U.S. is a large consumer, but also a large producer and exporter. The consumption is mainly focused on um, residential heating. There are no incentives for industrial uh, use, uh, for example, in, in the electricity production. Uh, so there are about 1.3 million pellet stoves which use um, this renewable fuel uh, which we are dealing with in, in this study. So uh, you can also see the United Kingdom with almost no production and the large consumption, which is mostly electricity, and the U.S. and also Canada they do provide the materials for the United Kingdom, and this also is reflected by the quality. So most of the pellets exported by Canada and the U.S. are in the industrial quality sector, not in the residential sector, which is a higher uh, quality class. So when we look uh, into the two countries, these are the figures up to uh, 2015. We can see that Canada uh, has had a constant growth starting from 2008 to 2015 in the capacity, but this capacity is not very well used, um, but also the production has increased uh, up to 2015 uh, to some shares. Uh, what we do have seen in 2016 is a dramatic increase. So there was a capacity extension of uh, 1 million tons. So from the about um, 3 million tons we have uh, seen in 2012, uh, there has been now, or there are now 4 million tons of um, capacity. And this is also, also reflected in the, the export figures. The export went up by 46% in 2016. Uh, which is mainly due to Japan, uh, which has an increase of 240%, and of course also the UK with an increase of 38%. Uh, for reasons of comparison, uh, we did not include this in, in the graphs here, uh, so they are to 2015 and also uh, the, the export figures. Um, but I just would like to mention this as a very special development uh, in Canada in the last year. So. Um, when you look at the export numbers and also the export market, you can see that Canada has increased the export shares over time. And the main market, of course, again, is uh, the United Kingdom. So they make up the largest shares. But also uh, Japan and South Korea are goals for, for the export uh, operations of Canada. And this is a little bit different in the U.S., where you also see a very constant growth. Uh, from 2008, or actually from 2004, there has been a great expansion in the production capacities and uh, also um, in the production quantities. The internal use has stayed very low in both countries, which is due to, to lack of um, support schemes, um, actually. So when we look at the exports of the U.S., you can also see that in the United Kingdom, the 3.5 million tons is the largest exporters, followed by other countries in Europe. So the total exports uh, equal uh, 99%. So 99% of all exports from the U.S. are going to um, the U through Europe. There's a little bit of export also uh, to Canada, but this is basically just some um, cross-border trade for residential use. So Canada 
uh, has a very little exports. Uh, these come uh, also from exclusively the U.S. Um, but here I would also like to well, visualize the shares and the dominance of the U.K. market um, for, for these two large uh, exporters. So for Canada, it's 62% of all exports uh, which are going to the United Kingdom. This is the figures of 2015. As I mentioned, 2016, uh, uh, the share is even higher. We do not have the figures uh, for, for the U.S. Uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, digital markets which have grown extensively in Asia are Japan and uh, South Korea. Uh, so Canada is providing these two. Um, but uh, the U.S. is exclusively actually the um, supporter or deliverer to Europe. Um, this is also reflected in the location of the pellet mills. You can see that in the U.S. you have a lot of these plants um, at the eastern or in south into the southeast, and this is due to one, you have the, the industry here, so there's a lot of wood processing industry already established. You also have the, the labor, so a lot of qualified people who can work there, and you have the proximity to the ports, which makes it very cost efficient uh, to export to Europe. The production actually started off in, in the United States in uh, northeast and uh, northwest to provide uh, a residential market and um, that that sector that market has stayed very stable over the years but the export market has increased dramatically so the growth which I have shown you is mainly due to the capacity of production increases in the southeast of the US and uh, Canada most of the production capacities are concentrated in British Columbia. And here you have two large ports uh, which, which are used for the export uh, to Europe and to Asia. One is Vancouver and the other one is the Prince Rupert uh, port. So you have some smaller capacities uh, in the middle of the country which are providing the residential market and they mostly feature smaller capacities like 50,000 tons per year. The larger ones, uh, they go up to 150,000 tons. Uh, when it comes to uh, plant capacities, uh, the blue spots you can see, these are established plants, and the green ones, these are planned. So uh, most of the capacities planned for 2016 have been established, and they are are no reports on, on further expansion of the capacities uh, in Canada. On the other hand, for the U.S., there have been reports about uh, 3.5 million tons additional production capacity, but we will see uh, if this is coming online or not. So this was the status quo and uh, the past. Uh, what can we talk about the future for Canada? The export market will continue to dominate, dominate, and Japan and South Korea probably will show uh, major growth. Japan is projected to be up to 11 to 12 million tons uh, of market, so there's a lot of potential there. But this is also depending on the frame conditions there. The domestic demand is probably not going to increase uh, much. Uh, Co-firing. Uh, it's complicated. There are other biomass options uh, which are preferred. So uh, there's no expectations to, to see um, any increase there. There's one plant who is uh, co-firing, or well, even up to 100%, and that's a plant with a capacity of 100,000. And that's one-third of the uh, domestic consumption in Canada. So residential heating is not very much uh, supported, and so the prices for crude oil and heating will be the tipping point here. Industrial application might be an internal market, especially when it comes to biofuel production for, for transport, uh, but this is still far away and uh, not seen in the near future. The situation in the U.S. is similar. Also, the export will 
continue to dominate here. And the domestic demand is mostly impacted by the lack of incentives for industrial use. So what we see is uh, used by private people and they switch to pellets because of the fossil fuel crisis. So when they are right, they will switch and also advantages and comfort. So when you have a uh, stove that, that fires logs, uh, it might be more convenient to have pellets because of automatic feeding and so on. And this is one of the reasons why they switch, uh, why they have these uh, 1.3 million pellet stoves in the US. So, but there are little other incentives to switch to pellets in residential heating. So there are quotas for the utilities. So when we talk about electricity production, but um, they are just one option to, uh, biomass is just one option to fulfill these standards. So other um, uh, renewable energies like wind uh, will be preferred probably because they are cheaper. So one development which is uh, very special is that the industry in the southeast uh, is going down when it comes to pulp and paper production because of more digital content. And so there are capacities actually freed uh, for the production of wood pellets. And so the processing capacities stay the same in this area, uh, but they switch from pulp and paper to pellets. So they, they compensate, but um, the dramatic growth you have seen is only compensating for the losses and not creating uh, much additional um, revenue for, for the region. Yeah, so much for the large producers and exporters. Uh, thank you very much. I would like now to hand over to Fabian, who is going to talk more about the center of consumption in Europe. Thank you, Kay, very much for this um, interesting point of view of the large producers. Thank you, dear audience, for tuning in today. I will now show you in the next um, 10 minutes the most important key facts about the center of, pell of pellet consumption. As we have already seen, the EU is the main importer of wood pellets, mainly from North America, but also from Russia and other CIS countries. Some questions about this center of consumption that we try to answer in our Global Wood Pellets Report are listed on this slide, and I will now focus in this short overview on what are wood pellets used for and where within the EU, what's the current prices, and what could be potential drivers and barriers with regard to future development. First, to the overall European consumer portfolio from smallest to largest. In Europe, several consumer types developed which are based on or can use wood pellets as an energy commodity. We have small-scale heating applications for residential heating, either in simple stoves or in water boilers. Furthermore, boilers are also used in multi-family houses, but also schools, hospitals, etc. Rather new on the market, but also interesting, are micro-CHPs, micro-combined heat and power which are small-scale heat and power producers based on the sterling technology. Medium-scale heating only can be found for district heating or more uncommon for process heating in, your, in the industry. And then there is highly efficient medium to large-scale CHP for district heating for larger cities and the feed-in of power into the electricity grid. Plus, there are few large-scale power production in converted coal-fired power plants. Specifically, these few large-scale power plants take up a large share in European wood pellet consumption. The main consumers in Europe in 2015 was definitely the UK, mainly for the formerly coal-fired power plants of drugs. Pellets to the UK are mainly imported, as you have seen, from the US and Canada. But also Belgium's pellet consumption is dominated by large-scale power plants, however, in a different magnitude than the UK. Denmark uses about 70% of their pellets for large-scale utilities for heat and power with almost exclusively imported pellets. The rest is mainly used for private use and in small shares in heat-only plants. 
public buildings and also the industry. In contrary to the U.S., however, largest import uh, no, in contrary to UK, however, largest import countries to Denmark are Latvia, Estonia, and Russia. Also in Sweden, the main share is consumed in a diverse medium and large scale market, including process heat, district heating, and combined heat and power. And interestingly, in the past, also temporarily for biomethane from gasification in Gasseburg. Main importers to Sweden are Russia and Latvia. Another consumer distribution can again be found for Italy. Here, pellets are mainly used for heating purposes in the residential sector in the north of Italy. And important to notice, in stove. That means consumers are purchasing pellets in the smallest entities, in sacks of 15 kilograms. Main importers to Italy in 2015 were Austria, Croatia, and Germany. An interesting and upcoming market is also France, with a growing consumer volume with high pellet stoves for residential heating shares. The last two examples are Germany and Austria. Both have a relatively high residential wood pellet consumption, mainly in boilers, but for Germany also with a high share in stoves. Imports to Germany originate from Russia, Poland and Denmark, while imports to Austria originate mainly from Romania. Additionally, a strong bilateral trade between Germany and Austria, meaning large trade volumes in both directions can be observed. Even though we discuss Europe as the main consumer in our global wood pellet report, Europe is also the largest producer of wood pellets, with increasing output of about 10 million tons in 2011 to about 14 million tons in 2015. In comparison, Kay talked about the North American market with under 10 million ton production in 2015. Largest producer are still Germany and Sweden, mainly based on sawmill byproducts, namely sawdust but also low quality round wood in Germany. Capacities are between 20,000 tons and 100,000 tons in Germany, or between a couple of hundred tons to almost 200,000 tons in Sweden. However, these countries exhibit stagnating production since smaller scale producers got out of operation due to the strong coupling with the sawmill industry and their respective development. In Latvia, as well as in Estonia, pellet production was booming in the last years and they became also important players in the EU market, with main exports to Denmark and the UK. Here, mainly the dollar exchange rate brought a competitive advantage against UK pellets, against US pellets, sorry. Pellet prices are shown here only for the residential consumer. Since the comparison between medium and large-scale consumers is difficult to derive due to bilateral contracts and vertical integration for the largest consumers. For the residential market, we find prices between 200 and 250 euro per ton, with a price drop during 2016. This price drop was induced by an oversupply of pellets due to relatively mild winters in 2014 and 2015. Looking into the few countries for which we have monthly data, we find seasonal price development with prices being sensitive to the monthly demand in the countries. In previous studies, we furthermore found contrasting results with regard to the co-movement of pellet prices between the various countries, with highest chances of market integration between Germany, Austria, and Italy. However, price data quality and comparability is in general low and would have to be harmonized, which would be the most cost-effective way to improve pellet market efficiency. Now to a short outlook about the pellet market development in Europe. Europe is most likely to be defined also in the future through local consumption with some wild cards with regard to the policy impact on large-scale consumers like drugs, RVE, and Hofford. According to the Global Wood Pellets Report, there are several factors that could have an increasing or decreasing impact on wood pellet consumption in Europe. 
including for the increasing size, we have commodity markets. If the commodity market is transitioning to higher efficiency, to uh, um, higher maturity, or the utilization for process heat in European industries, as well as um, a grid parity for micro CHPs, and already tested for a while in Gasbrook in Sweden, the production of second generation biofuels through gasification. On the other hand, we find the very welcome increasing isolation of buildings and increased utilization of excess industry heat as something that could decrease wood pellet consumption in the UA, uh, EU. On the medium to longer term, also the increasing use of heat pumps, but also global warming have to be taken into account with regard to future pellet consumption in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions, opinions, and input. Martin, I would like to hand over the microphone to you. Um, Martin, I would like to hand over the microphone to you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, very good. So again, I would like to present briefly about sustainability legislation and criteria for wood pellets. And so to start off with, it's perhaps important to point out that for the large majority of wood pellets, there are no mandatory sustainability criteria currently for the residential and non-industrial use. So in principle, all countries in the world, as far as we know, do not impose mandatory sustainability criteria to the small scale use. And also for the future, this is likely going to remain. Um, however, for large scale industrial use, especially in Europe, there have been in the last years, but also in the future years, there are some important developments. It's important to point out that uh, contrary to liquid and gaseous transport fuels, there are no uniform sustainability criteria that apply to solid biomass uh, for use for energy in the EU. So for liquid biofuels, there are uniform criteria. And if you meet these criteria, your, the use will count towards the target. But for solid biomass, there was a long debate in the last few years. And there was no uh, unanimous decision within the EU member states whether or not there should be uniform criteria. Some, especially the importing countries, favored a harmonization or a uniform introduction of criteria, but others mainly producing and locally using uh, biomass uh, also for other purposes uh, rejected that. And so ultimately it was decided that um, national member states can develop their own uh, sustainability criteria. And so this is what happened, especially the countries which imported or still import a large amount of biomass. So the UK, Netherlands, Belgium, and Denmark developed sustainability criteria for uh, wood pellets for coal firing um, with similar but unfortunately slightly different criteria as I will show on the next slide. We are currently not aware of any sustainability criteria in Japan. And we know that there were some developments in South Korea, but it is a bit unclear to us what the current status is, whether there are, for example, sustainable forest management certificates like FC or PSC are still required. But in anyhow, I just talked to a number of uh, Japanese policymakers and stakeholders, and there are increasing concerns about the sustainability of feedstocks in this region as well. So it may well happen that in the near future, there will be sustainability criteria introduced in these countries as well. But coming back to the four countries in the EU, this is not included in the uh, pellet study ourselves, but this was very recently published by our, my colleague, Tui Maimouna. So if you are interested in this, the link or the, the title is given below in the document in identifier. This was a document in which the four, uh, the legislation in the four countries is compared. And as you can see from this very big and complex table, there are a lot of different criteria. Um, this is only half of the table, in fact, um, and it shows you how complex the situation is. So first of all, the implementation of these criteria the timeline is different. Um, some of them, especially the UK, have already implemented uh, sustainability legislation for a long time. The same goes for Belgium. Um, in the Netherlands, this is still ongoing. Uh, it's to be determined, but uh, as imports will be starting very soon, uh, this now really needs to get operational very quickly. And in Denmark, it is operational, but it will also be under revision uh, next year again. 
In terms of sustainability coverage, there are a number of uh, categories. The most important one, obviously, is avoided greenhouse gas emissions. And so basically, um, all uh, systems measure uh, the amount of greenhouse gases emitted in the chain, but they do it in different ways. So especially the, the Belgian uh, ways, there have actually two ways in Wallonia and Flanders, differs from the rest of uh, the EU or for the other three countries. The others follow a more or less harmonized approach, but even there, there are, for example, differences with regard to the threshold. So in some countries, would tell to have to meet a 70% target and then have to go up to 75. But for example, in the UK, there's also a rule that um, uh, the overall average imports need to have a greenhouse gas emission reduction of 70%, but individual uh, uh, deliveries can only have to meet 60% as long as the overall and average make, make 70. Other countries don't have these kind of rules. So there are clear uh, distinct differences. Um, the same goes about, let's say, example, uh, the limits compared to 1990, they differ somewhat. Then there's um, a category called land use criteria. These include predominantly sustainable forest man criteria, uh, management criteria. And here, all the systems basically rely on existing systems like uh, PSC and FSC. But the actual criteria, which have to be met, can differ again between the different four member countries. So for example, whether biodiversity has to be maintained or even has to be increased, that can differ, um, which feedstock categories uh, are allowed, uh, that can differ. And let's say the Netherlands especially have developed uh, also criteria regarding indirect land use change and carbon depth, which are not included in any of the other systems. So again, this is very complex. If you want to know more about this, then you can read this in the open access free to download article by Three My Um Going a bit further on this, um, from the task 40 perspective, we think that harmonization of these criteria and systems will be important because, um, in principle, pellet producers in the US or Canada don't know to which market, to which end user they are going to deliver or their pellets will be delivered because they typically tell, sell to traders as well. And obviously, um, meeting four different sustainability criteria systems is very hard. Um, and especially if there are additional criteria like I look and carbon debt, um, harmonizing these different systems and getting certified for all four of them is anything but easy. Um, again, these systems are also not static. They are sometimes even being further developed. In the Netherlands, uh, there is also a trend that at the moment uh, it is possible to, to apply risk-based approach, but especially until 2020, um, certification will have to take uh, place on a forest management unit level. In other words, the individual forest plots from which the feedstock for the wood pellet mills will have to be certified, which is going to be a major challenge. Um, as far as we know, the only initiative currently attempting to actually uh, prove um, compliance with all criteria in all countries is the Sustainable Biomass Program. Um, but even again, this they have to shoot at a moving target, so this is anything but easy. Um, at the same time, in the EU, there are ongoing discussions under the frame of the Renewable Energy Directive, the recast. So basically, uh, in last year, around this time of the year, the European Commission published an initial proposal, um, and this actually did cover mandatory sustainability criteria for solid biomass. So this included a specific feedstock approach. It included a risk-based approach, meaning that you can apply, you can uh, test some criteria in general for, for example, the, a certain area. You don't need to certify every single stand. And it will require very stringent greenhouse gas savings. This would be 80% in 2021 and would even be going up to 85% in 2026, which is extremely tough to meet. It was also proposed that um, from 2021 onwards, biomass will only have to be used in highly efficient combined heat and power plants. So uh, plants producing electricity only would basically not be able to use wood pellets. Now, since then, this proposal has been discussed extensively in the European Parliament and also in the Council, and there are at the moment a number of uh, different proposals on the table. One is that, uh, for example, uh, the EU will not be able, or individual countries within the EU should not be able to import wood pellets from countries that have, have not ratified the COP21 Paris Agreement. So if this would actually be implemented, this would have major repercussions with regard to US uh, exports to the EU, at least at the current status of uh, politics. 
Um, also, there's a reference to the waste hierarchy, and so basically uh, producers may have to prove that they are not distorting any other markets for material use. So cascading should be included. Again, this could have major implications also for European producers. Um, in principle, the first idea was to have uh, criteria, identical criteria for all member states, but now again on the table is that individual member states may be able to set additional criteria if they find that the common criteria on EU level might not be uh, stringent enough, which again would not create a level playing field and would make the trade of biomass on wood pellets much more difficult. Now this discussion is still ongoing, and as I understood, um, this will likely going to is going to continue well into 2018. So hopefully by uh, this time next year, there should be a clear and decided proposal on the table. But this discussion will still continue for some time. Some thoughts from let's say our own task. Um, we think that uniform EU sustainability criteria should, in principle, provide clear security and guidance to the industry and facilitate trade of wood. Felt that these would be preferable over a patchwork of individual legislations. Um, we also find it problematic if there are different criteria for the use of wood for different end users. So, for example, we already see now that the European Commission is also promoting the production of second generation biofuels and biochemicals. These may be produced in biorefineries, which could also as byproducts produce electricity or heat. And this could lead to the very strange situation that um, one single plant produces several outputs. And for some of the outputs, it would have to prove sustainability. And for others, it wouldn't. Obviously, this is not very productive. And so in our view, a single set of criteria for all woody biomass, regardless of the end use, would be preferable. And ultimately, these kind of criteria would also have to be aligned on a global level. In other words, if only the EU is going to implement sustainability criteria, then only the sustainable biomass would go to Europe. And um, other importing regions would then obviously take the wood pellets, which would not meet the EU requirements. So ultimately, this would be a kind of carbon leakage, which obviously should be avoided. So again, this is a field which will be uh, under development for some time to come. And for sure, also Task 40 will monitor this field in the future. So if you want to up, stay up to date on this, uh, pay it, uh, a visit to the Task 40 website once in a while, and we hope to publish more on this in the future. With that short overview of sustainability, there will be time for questions after uh, time for questions after Michael's presentation. I want to hand over to Michael Wild to present a short outlook on uh, torrefied pellets. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Martin. This is Michael Wild, and I hope you all can hear me. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, looking forward a little bit, uh, talking about the recent developments in torrefaction. Yeah, uh, for the overall pellet sector, the way forward means um, just broadening of customer bases, new markets, new products, new processes to improve the range of application. And under these new processes, torrefaction is by far the most developed and the most implemented uh, of these processes already. For those who have not been in touch with torrefaction yet, um, this is a kind of super drying or roasting, very similar to applied to coffee roasting. Uh, biomass is roasted under inert atmosphere at about 300 centigrades. It turns black and it changes its characteristics almost to the uh, characteristics of charcoal. However, at a much, much more efficient uh, process. Now, uh, talking about tradability and trade of, uh, of any biomass and uh, pellets, it's always important to know what the product is. Now, for torrefied biomass and thermally treated biomass in general, uh, there is a standard, the ISO technical specification 17225-8, which is in structure and mostly all the values very similar and parameters very similar to uh, the one of the white wood pellets, uh, independent of household or industrial sector. Um, and uh, it defines quite well um, the specifications for woody biomass and for non-woody biomass. So for thermally treated and torrefied pellets, there is a standard in place, and this forms the basis for all kind of trade, which starts currently uh, to be implemented. Uh, torrefied biomass in its field. Um, this is here. What is the difference between torrefied biomass and, for instance, white wood pellets, and why is it so, so a good substitute for steam coal? 
with if we look at bulk density, we do see that there is not such a major difference. However, torrefied biomass has a higher bulk density. But the most important is that through to the torrefaction process, the net calorific value of the product increases significantly from 16.5 as in the ISO standard for white wood pellet to a minimum of 21 uh, as in the standard for torrefied pellets. So very close to those of steam coal already. If you multiply the net calorific value times the um, bulk density, you see what the shipping density is. And the shipping density in reality is the measure of which defines the costs for the transportation, meaning torrefied pellets can be transported much further for the same price as white wood pellets can be, or vice versa, will be much cheaper on the same destinations. That torrefied pellets are very easily storable in the coal yard because they are water resistant, grindable in coal mills, and do uh, behave in pneumatic transport like coal already points that torrefied pellets will have its application mostly in uh, power plants more than in households. Nevertheless, torrefied pellets is just one of the products of torrefaction, and there are other things where, which are a bit out of energy of the energy field uh, also appearing. Now, looking at the processes, I mean, we see that there is a lot of advantages of torrefied pellets, but uh, does it come at any significant cost? If we compare the uh, process efficiency of torrefaction pellet production with white wood pellet production, we learn that the th overall thermal efficiency of the overall process uh, between uh, in torrefied pellets is about 19.6%. Uh, white wood pellets in the case have 91.1%, almost within the range of statistical insecurity. These figures have been produced by ECN, uh, a Dutch research institute, which has carried out this uh, study on behalf of the IPTC. The electric efficiency is also very, very similar, very close between uh, torrefied pellets and white wood pellets. So conclusion is in the processing, so the production of the product, there's almost no difference in the uh, energy efficiency. Now, how does it look uh, if we go for uh, the overall supply chain and compare them? Here we see a full supply chain from uh, the harvesting and process of the uh, pro um, delivery of the product to the processing plant, the processing itself, the transport to port, the loading, the shipping. Uh, here on the example of um, uh, Indonesia to Japan, one of the new uh, major shipping uh, destinations for pellets, about 5,500 kilometers, almost similar to across the Atlantic. And then unloading to the customer, meaning unloading the, 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 uh, the, the vessel and the uh, tertiary transport to the, co to the stockyard of the customer. Comparing the two, we see that on a megajoule uh, per gigajoule um, energy consumption basis, gigajoule delivered uh, energy, um, we see that there is a difference of about 4 to 5 percent, which is safe in terms of um, energy consumption along the overall supply chain if you implement or if you consume torrefied pellets versus white wood pellets. Now, this is maybe not the big saving as it looks here, but in terms of the thresholds of uh, the uh, greenhouse gas substitution uh, for the implementation of biomass, which is in place in uh, European member states and currently under discussion uh, and will be increased to 75 or 80 percent. This 5 percent uh, may make the difference between uh, application possibility of biomass uh, or not. The most of the advantages, obviously, in this supply chain analysis are downstream. So from the processing to the consumer. And here we have, uh, we have compared different uh, vessel classes, handy size, handy max, pan max, so about 25,000, 35,000, and 60,000 metric tons of uh, torrefied pellets versus white wood pellets. You see that here the savings in this part are extremely uh, high, as well also in the unloading. So from sieve to, to the stockyard, meaning unloading in the port and the tertiary transport to the, um, to the consumer here, we are almost 25% uh, more efficient. This all reflects a significant savings along the whole world supply chain in greenhouse gases. And here are different supply chains also compared, where we have uh, white wood pellets in comparison to torrefied pellets. Um, 
we have now looked at the advantages we uh, can see for torrefaction. And the question is, is torrefaction really existing? Does it, is it implemented, or is it just a, a scientific project? Yes. Now, in this torrefaction implementation imp indicator, I try always to uh, explain where the industry is standing. Um, Ten years ago, this or eight years ago, this torrefaction uh, indicator had in the bottom part some red parts and some yellow parts. As you see here, well, really also all the, 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 the processing and the handling and storing and transportation and consumption is uh, listed as, uh, as parameter. You see all Almost all is perfectly done and completely done or well in process and well um, in uh, implementation. So um, looking at this, one can say torrefaction at the moment is really uh, in its first steps of getting into real implementation and into uh, higher consumption. And this is also seen here I have from selected producers. This is by far not all of the producers of torrefied uh, pellets in the market. Uh, we have here a list of existing plants producing today, which is about 150,000 tons. Uh, I would estimate the total global capacity of torrefied pellets at the moment is around 300, 350,000 tons. Uh, the same producers are committed to implement another uh, list of uh, projects already. Some of them, the ground is already broken or they are under construction. Some of them are just waiting for financial closing. This is around 1.2 million tons, and there is a long pipeline of further projects uh, which are to be implemented soon, and we see more and more customers to be interested in switching to uh, torrefied pellets, especially in these regions where the pellet train arrived only now, so where the biomass only now is implemented in the coal power plants or in the overall uh, energy balance. Uh, by this, I end my presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I think now it's up with the, with the uh, Q&A session. I hand over to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And so I would like to ask Ronnie to bring up the chat window. So as we have 76 participants at the moment joining, you can imagine that if we open up the lines, it will be one big pandemonium. So we would like to ask um, everybody who has questions to type them in the chat box. And so we will wait one or two minutes, and then we will try to group them and uh, assign a number of questions to to our presenters and see if we can answer them as good as possible. So again, um, please uh, put your questions in the chat box. And perhaps um, we can already uh, have a first uh, uh, question by Milas de Souza, who wants to know what the share of wood pellets in the UK energy matrix is. So perhaps it's uh, important to differentiate between energy and electricity. I think um, uh, energy is probably very low, but electricity, um, I'm going to ask Fabian or uh, any of the other speakers, do you have a mo number on the actual contribution to the UK energy or electricity mix uh, of wood pellets? Anybody of you? I'm right now actually scanning the global wood pellet report. Um, give me a second. <laughs> sure. So we will look that up if we can find it. Um, then the question is, why is China not using wood pellets once uh, they are very concerned on reducing CO2 emissions? Well, that is an excellent question. As we said, China is the great unknown, so it is very difficult to get any clear information about the use of bi uh, biomass in China. Um, as far as we know, of, I think the most obvious uh, application for China to, to start using biomass on a larger scale is actually agricultural residues like straw, which they have in huge amounts. Um, so for the moment, it is a bit unclear if they would actually go for imports of large-scale wood pellets, which would be probably more expensive than the local potential they have for, for biomass. And then Jonathan Hollander would like to know where are most of the torrefied pellets being consumed and in what application? That seems to me a clear question to Michel. Can you pick that up? If I can, I hope you mm -hmm. hear me, and I hope I have unmuted properly. I yeah, hope we I hear you. Properly, and you can hear me. Um, now, first of all, uh, torrefied pellets currently are mostly in large uh, coal power plants or in process energy plants uh, uh, consumed. So coal power plants co-firing and process energy uh, for steam or heat in, in industrial plants. 
um, I, I see there are some more torrefaction questions, and I just pick them up quickly once I'm speaking. Uh, the next question was, what is the difference in costs between torrefied pellets and current U.S. pellets? Now, it's always a bit difficult to speak generally about costs if you do not define when and where. But basically, there is no reason that torrefied biomass is uh, more expensive on an energy basis, so per gigajoule delivered uh, to the consumer, than our whitewood pellets. And this is also the contracts uh, or the, deliver the deliveries we see uh, currently. And there was another question about steam exploded pellets referred to in the torrefaction sector. Uh, is this the equivalent to silica black pellets? Now, silica black pellets was a product produced by Silca. Silca went out of business uh, as far as I know, and they hijacked the name black for their pellets. Uh, but basically, uh, steam ex this was a steam explosion process, uh, and this is now uh, taken further by a Norwegian company. Yeah. By this, uh, I know, does Norway have torrefied pellet production capacity? Uh, I don't think so. Um, in Canada, there are uh, three producers, uh, currently most active, Erics uh, uh, Limited, Erics Energy Limited. By this, I return to Martin. Yeah, you have one more question as we're with you, and that is from Ben Dooley about the commercial contracts between torrefied pellet uh, producers. Uh, 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 so are there any commercial contracts between torrefied pellet producers and large-scale consumers, or are these just trials? These are uh, trials, and uh, there is a first commercial contract in negotiation, uh, as far as I'm informed currently. And uh, some of the uh, Asian power plants are in their second or third level of trials and, and uh, for technical permissions for products from torrefaction. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to pick up two questions myself, and that is uh, from Jim McMillan, the biggest threats and opportunities, and also about the question from Fiona Matthews, what will happen to large-scale coal conversion when subsidies end, if pellets can compete with, uh, without subsidies? Well, I think the short answer to the last question is no. We have seen a dramatic decrease of costs from uh, both offshore and onshore wind, but also from PV systems uh, currently. So, and as these uh, uh, technologies do not require any fuel, their marginal costs are very low. So, at the moment, we see a trend where, or at least a general expectation, that onshore and offshore wind will actually be to run without or with minimal subsidies. In that sense, wood pellets will not be able to compete directly. Um, with these kind of renewable, this, uh, 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 intermittent renewable resources. On the other hand, we also uh, will be facing situations where the share of intermittent renewables will be very high and may fluctuate strongly. And so in that sense, the, the price of intermittency and the, uh, the let's say, the worth that, that dispatchable renewable power has uh, still needs to be determined. So if we go to scenarios where there's a large uh, share of intermittency, then especially, for example, in Europe in months like uh, November, December, January, when there is very little sun, and there may also be several days without a lot of wind, then actually wind, uh, so biomass could have a role uh, to and provide uh, capacity. But again, these are, on the one hand side, I would say major threats. On the other hand, also uh, possible opportunities for, for biomass as a dispatchable source of heat and electricity. Um, I'm coming briefly back to Fabian. Do we know more about the share of wood pellets in the UK electricity mix? Um, I'm down to about 8%, but I'm not sure. I have to recalculate it. But I guess it's, um, it's pretty high for the wood pellets because the drugs power plant, they have, um, they have a total volume of um, 630 megawatts, and that's time three, so there are three units of drugs. And then you still have two more units that's about 300, 400 megawatts. So that's yeah. quite impressive. Yeah, so I would say uh, three, uh, two, two gigawatts of capacity, 7.5 million tons per year, probably 5 to 8 percent sounds like a reasonable estimate, but we can try to look it up later on. Um, let's okay. see, more questions. Well, Is there, sorry? Uh, this is Kai, uh, just one more addition. In the yeah. UK, in 2014, we had 20% electricity from biomass uh, in total. Maybe this is also okay. an interesting figure. Perfect. Thank you, Kai. 
trying to, to work the questions down a bit, uh, uh, let's say, from, from top to bottom. There's another question about uh, the, the conditions for Brazil to join the market. Um, yes, we have seen some developments in the past uh, in Brazil. A major a pulp and paper producer had announced major plans to also produce uh, wood pellets uh, from eucalypt plantations. Um, however, this has so far never materialized, probably for a number of reasons. Probably um, the pulp and paper market is very competitive in this region as well, so there's a clear yeah, opportunity cost should we use, uh, produce uh, wood for paper or for pellets. Um, then apparently in eucalyptus there's also quite a high chlorine content, which may not be beneficial, especially for large-scale industrial boilers. And so, yeah, possibly also other factors like exchange rates, accessibility, distance to the markets will have played a role, but so far Brazil has not. Uh, they have some very small plants and there's some very minor export going on, as we know, but nothing significant, nothing comparable to Canada and, and especially the U.S. And then perhaps the other question about the Paris Accord. Um, again, this is not set in stone. I think the main reason for excluding countries that have, will not sign the Paris Agreement is the fact that then they also not, do not fall on the LULUCF regulations. And that, so that would mean that the U.S. at least hypothetically could da cut down their forests and not be, uh, uh, this, this change would not be counted, but in Europe this biomass would still be counted as carbon neutral, which is not true if the, the forest would not be replanted. And so I think that is the basic underlying reason why at the moment uh, the proposal is to only allow imports, at least to count towards the European target, towards uh, the renewable energy chair, which are from countries which have ratified uh, the Paris Agreement. I'm looking maybe, a bit down. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah. Maybe, uh, Martin, this is Daniela. I just wanted to add one uh, general uh, 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 thing. If you go, try to join this p a global pallet market, it is always, uh, let's say, a longer term process to uh, develop the uh, defined product qualities, defined in ISO. There are also product qualities for residential market and for industrial application. This really takes uh, some time of experience and uh, in addition I think it's important to be aware of the sustainability expectation in the different regions we have mentioned already in the discussion. Yeah, I, I fully agree. We have another question regarding sustainability of agricultural land and straw removals. Now, this is perhaps a bit off topic for today. Yes, there is a, a, a risk of depleting soil organic carbon and, and soil erosion if you would remove excessive amounts of straw. At the same time, we see that in many countries there is, actually, there is a certain amount, a surplus, which you could remove sustainably. Uh, one other example, which is, again, Brazil, is sugarcane, where the burning of the trash of the tops and leaves is outlawed because of uh, the, the smoke pollution and so there we see a massive amount of sugarcane straw lying on the fields and actually causing massive problems with diseases and, and so there uh, a part of the straw certainly could be used sustainably. Again, there the cha main challenge will be to mobilize the straw to make it, uh, to pelletize it perhaps to use it either locally or even for export, but those are new chains which need to be developed. Yes, I and maybe uh, Martin, yeah. I just can add here some experience from Germany. You, what might make sense is to uh, add some straw to wood pallets. We have mm -hmm. seen that up to 10 percent you, you don't have, let's say, you have, the, co have comparable uh, properties in your, burn, uh, in your burners. And if you go for higher shares of straw, you uh, need totally different devices for using the pellets. Yeah, very good. I think you also then get into problems with ash content, etc. Yes. So again, it depends also very much on the end use, whether it's residential or industrial. I'm asking all of my uh, fellow, fellow presenters, do you know of any commercial plant using wood pellets for second generation biofreeze to produce uh, biochemicals or biofuels through gasification? I'm not aware of any, but perhaps you can correct me. There was the one in Göteborg, the gasification. Somebody knows more about that question? The, the Gobi gas project, yeah. That could be, but I'm not sure if they're using wood pellets. I'm not sure if they're using wood pellets anymore, but I guess they, they did. Um, they, they did. 
So if anything, then probably on a pilot scale, yes, but certainly not on any major commercial scale. Then Pat Smith is asking about uh, the, the production capacity, the global co production capacity and uh, the demand. So production capacity at least seems to exceed demand significantly. Um, is, this, is there a shortage of demand? Or, and can we expect capacity and demand to come into equilibrium? Um, Daniela, maybe as discussing the global picture, can you provide some feedback on that? So we have uh, seen also in the past that we have uh, quite higher co production capacities than production. So this is, let's say, uh, in historical pictures during all times of development. And the question if, uh, c if we can expect uh, more equilibrium strongly depends on all the factors we have discussed. But the, the differences between production capacity and productions are found in all countries and also over most of the time. Okay. Then I see a number of questions regarding the sustainability. So Tap Smith would like to know whether there's evidence that sustainability standards are limiting global trade. There's a question from Tammy Bailey regarding the sustainability seem, standards seem a bit strict, limiting import exports. Why the limitations? There is benefit to having multiple value streams to secure uh, sustainability. And Marinus Favai would like to know whether certified forest sustainability criteria in Canada can meet the European forest sustainability standards for trade in the future. Um, perhaps the last question is the most difficult to answer because there are, of course, many different systems, CSA and FSC and, and uh, PSC. And so basically, um, uh, it also depends on how, what are, is accept, uh, accepted in the four different member states. So for example, in, in the Netherlands, I know that the, let's say, um, uh, comparing the different forestry uh, FSM standards against the regulation is, is still ongoing, so we don't know. Um, in other uh, countries like the UK, I think um, they have accepted the majority of, of uh, systems so far. Um, whether there's really evidence that sustainability standards are currently limiting global trade, probably not, because uh, the UK does, you know, at least at the moment, not have any problems meeting its demands. At the same time, um, as I ex uh, explained, the Netherlands currently have the most stringent criteria, and we are just starting uh, coal firing again, but we are supposed to reach 3 million tons by 2020, and there are uh, significant concerns whether there will be enough feedstock that actually can be certified and meet the very stringent sustainability requirements. And so that links to the question why they are so strict. Um, let's say the media uh, coverage of wood pellet imports in the UK and the Netherlands have been pretty extensive and very negative. So they have tendencies to highlight the, let's say, black sheep, to, to highlight extremes and not the mainstream average production of wood pellets. So, uh, and there's also very much simplification and, 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 and very simple claims which are hard to or take more time to, to prove, disprove, for example, that wood pellets are causing a massive deforestation. Um, and then a, a clear cut is shown. So obviously a clear cut is, yes, a, 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 you remove carbon, you need that, but that does not mean that this is a permanent deforestation. So in, in the vast majority of cases, these forests are replanted or are, have natural regrowth. And so overall in the US Southeast, we see a, an over increase in uh, for, uh, forest carbon stocks. Nevertheless, there is a very big concern in the Netherlands and the UK and also other member states that um, using imported biomass may have severe sustainability implications in the producing countries. And hence, policymakers are uh, yeah, inclined to, to put up very strict sustainability re re legislation. Um, moving on, perhaps Kai or, or somebody else, what are the main factors limiting the Canadian export potential? Is it the supply chain costs? Anyone want to like to comment on that? Well, can, can you hear me? All right. So yeah. uh, I just had a look at, at the cost um, from Canada and the US. Uh, they're quite comparable, and I think both are competitive. Uh, we have seen the dramatic increases in production, so I don't think there are you know, limits uh, which are now um, 
decreasing the Canadian export potential? Well, I think hmm, I'm, I'm not sure if Pat, as a Canadian or at least uh, living in Canada, has had some insight on this to share as well. <laughs> um, I think it depends very much on, on the specific locations um, and on the feedstock potential. It also depends on how much biomass is harvested, of course, for timber and for, for, for uh, pulp. So basically, the vast majority of Canadian wood pellets, as far as I know myself, is still based on sawdust residues. If you want to use more dedicated feedstock uh, from the field, then this will increase supply chain costs significantly. And then if you still have to transport to uh, eight or 500 kilometers to a port and then ship it to Europe, that for sure will uh, yeah, not uh, improve the competitiveness of the, these pellets. Um, yep. Going on, sure. maybe a few more questions. We have 15 minutes or so left. Or Kai, do you want to add? Uh, no. So I, maybe I can also go for the question, much of the U.S. industrial sector is chips rather than pellets. What might increase use of pellets in industrial applications? So to be quite clear, to shift from uh, wood, wood chips to pellets, there are two reasons behind. And one is that pellets are a standardized product. This means especially if you have supply chains, long supply chains, not regional supply chains, where this helps if you if you discuss about a standardized product, you have all, this is a strong reason for pellets. So meaning that, that especially uh, uh, not regional supply chains have a pre could have a preference for pellets. And all, this is also true for shipping and loading and unload processes because they can be uh, yeah, much clearer done with uh, pellets and with chips. The so second uh, qu uh, point for switching is if you if you look at let's say the convenience factor when using the pellets, so pellets have a, a, a better uh, uh, properties because they are smaller and they behave a bit like a fl fluid. Uh, if you, for example, use automatically stoves. It's much easier on small scale. Uh, or, and on the other hand, if you go for a, a very large uh, combustion unit with dust combustion system where pellets, again, use uh, behave more like uh, uh, fuel dust than uh, wood woody wood chip stuff. So if you have, let's say, uh, uh, this kind of application, then it makes sense to switch from chips to pellets. And from for industrial applications, especially the, the question, are there long supply chains or are there additional uh, 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 advantages in using the fuels? Yeah. And, and maybe from my side, two more um, limitations of wood chips currently, at least as far as trade is concerned. In principle, wood chips could also be traded to Europe for power. Um, we know that wood chips are traded for, for example, pulp and paper production. But for energy, there are two major issues. One is the fact that uh, there are future sanitary measures in place. In other words, wood chips could contain pests, which um, uh, should okay. not be transported from, for example, North America to Europe. And so they, in order to import wood chips, you have to either fumigate or heat them, and both is quite costly, so this is not done. The second reason is probably, especially for the future, is that uh, wood chips contain typically a lot of water. And so when you ship them on, over long distances, you are also transporting a, long, a lot of water, as Michel has already showed. And especially with increasing um, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements, up to 80 85%, wood chips would have an increasingly hard time to meet these requirements because, again, you're shipping a lot of water instead of useful energy. OK, maybe to, to move on a, a bit more. Um, so basically, if imports from the US are limited by the R2, AD2, is there scope for increases in production inside the EU-28 or Russia? Um, well, maybe uh, Fabian, do you want to comment uh, about this uh, regarding the EU uh, scope for further production domestically? Well, um, I discussed the um, um, Baltic countries to, to be booming in, in production. There is also um, big pellet production plants built in, 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 in Russia with um, shipping over, um, I guess, St. Petersburg. Um, well, that's 
still remains the question if um, if these limitations will will come um, will strike heavily and and if there is going to be an how to say an um, deficit of foot pellets. Um, the main driver, as we discussed, is the UK in consumption, and the UK um, wants to achieve 30% of renewable energy by 2020 um, and phase out their high share of coal-fired power plants. Um, but after 2026, um, I guess, I'm not sure about that now, but around this time, the renewable applications run out, and um, that's why it's a wild card. And if this would fall out of the game, then and then the production capacity in Europe is is, is quite high in relation to what is consumed. Um, mm. So, what do you think, um, uh, Martin and then um, Daniela? Um, what's the future of that? I think, let's say, in terms of European domestic capacity, indeed, especially in Eastern Europe, there's probably a, a potential to increase wood pellet production. And the same might also perhaps go for France. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I think a number of other countries have already reached the, the domestic limits uh, of, of their, uh, their domestic potential. So there is a limited uh, uh, increase possible. Um, but I think especially Russia could have a, a major if at least they, they get the investments and if they can meet the sustainability requirements, then Russia could, in principle, become a major exporter of, of uh, wood pellets. I would like to link that also immediately to the question from Aldous from the, uh, from the COI, whether Europe uh, or Canada and, and the US are likely to decrease the exports and how likely this is. Um, well, I guess I don't think there's any policy in the US or Canada um, uh, right now to massively increase domestic use of biomass. Obviously, this may change in the future, depending on the next government in the US in a couple of years, hopefully. Uh, but for the moment, we don't see major drivers to, to focus on domestic biomass use. I think uh, given the vast amount of resources in Canada, even if Canada would decide to, for example, promote wood pellets for domestic use, then this would still mean that only a, a slightly larger part of their domestic potential would be tapped. Uh, I think in the U.S. it is more a question where, the, for example, the, the pulp and paper markets will uh, uh, increase again. If that would happen, then indeed, um, for example, there might be a much larger share of U.S. pulp wood going to those, those markets instead of, of wood pellets. Um, Kai and Daniela, would you like to add to this? Yes, I think there are two, uh, I fully agree, but and I think there are two aspects. One is that also in ma many of the German pellet uh, production units, there are the capacities are not fully used yet, or there is, let's say, some backup capacity in the system. And for the longer term, of course, with regard to the uh, wood production, uh, pellet production, uh, potential there's especially additional options they are in Russia or in Eastern Germany in Ge Eastern or Eastern Europe in general mm. okay. I'm trying to go through the questions whether we missed it. sorry any other comments be linked to yeah this could actually be linked to the question of uh, Jonathan Hollander that there is a large yeah. difference between production capacity and output and how we can explain that um, are most pellets sold under long-term OFTIC agreement, um, what should what, what would increase um, the capacity utilization? So these are, these are pretty good questions. I guess Michel Wild has some answers for that, why the capacities are so high and the production are so low or the difference is so high, um, and what type of um, um, contracts are there for, 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 uh, in, in the market. Um, I would like to have an open discussion about that. I guess um, it's also a lot about where you position your pellet production plant and how much um, um, how much sawdust, in the most cases, you can get for which price um, to produce your pellets for the market. So the capacities are not always perfectly used, and um, maybe Michel, you have some more answers about that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to answer this question. I mean, it's a bit tricky. I mean, production capacity and output differences. I mean, first of all, technical issues, nameplate capacities in certain countries, 
Uh, starting even in Western Europe, but also in the U.S., you have simply um, technically designed the pellet mills, which are not ideal or not optimum, uh, and you have uh, breakdowns or longer maintenance periods than, than expected, or even any other technical issues. Uh, the uh, second reason for um, shortcoming in production is the, the feedstock availability. Um, feedstock availability, I mean, as long as the pellet mill is not uh, connected directly to a sawmill um, and has a direct uh, input of sawdust, um, there are all kinds of reasons why feedstock may be short. The breakdown of, of, of the, the, the transportation infrastructure or other reasons, no failing in the, in the, in the forests whatsoever. So all, all of these reasons. And then there are economic reasons. I mean, certain uh, mills simply do uh, increase their costs in production because feedstock costs go up uh, step by step when the consumption becomes bigger. And in terms uh, or in times when the market price for pellets is low, it is not economical for the uh, producers to, to uh, ramp up the production to full capacity. Also, most of the times, or in most industries, you would expect that uh, the costs go down with uh, increased capacity or full, full, uh, full operation. Uh, this is not uh, true for all of the locations in, of the wood pellet industry, though for some it is uh, definitely true. Um, the pellets sold under long-term offtake agreements. Now, industrial uh, pellets to power plants, I would say the vast majority of those pellets are sold under long-term agreements, uh, or at least under term agreements. Um, and in household market or heat markets, it's right the opposite. I would not know of any long-term contract in this market. I mean, those are markets where you typically have either spot over the counter trades or you have uh, quarterly half-year contracts to the max. Well, that does not mean that there are not lasting relations between producers and traders or consumers. But here, uh, terms of contracts are renegotiated uh, quarterly or in half a year um, maximum. I hope that was a clear answer. I think it was a very clear answer. Thank you very much, Michel. I think there's one question we haven't answered yet, and that is the, the question about the benefits of uh, wood pellet production with, and compared to other renewable sources like wind. Um, so are the economic benefits for forest management, harvesting, transport, production, et cetera, considered? Um, yes, to a limited extent. I think uh, if you look especially from a forest owner perspective, then the added value of pellets may be limited because uh, basically the uh, a price that is paid for the feedstock is typically lower than, for example, pulp and paper or, or for timber. Yet again, especially in the U.S. where we saw a decline of the pulp and paper market, the wood pelt markets may um, actually provide an important source of income to forest owners to also decide to replant again because they know that there is offtake. In terms of uh, logistics and, and local employment, uh, yes, we've seen, especially again in the U.S. with these plants, that they are typically located in the middle of fiber basket, meaning that there's a lot of wood but very little else. And so, again, if pulp mills have closed, these uh, small-scale uh, villages, etc., have lost a lot of jobs. And again, wood pellet plants may actually bring new jobs in terms of uh, operationals, in terms of logistics. Um, we are currently, we have actually published or will publish a, a study on the U.S. on the socioeconomic impacts uh, of wood pellet production in the U.S. very soon, and we already had have published a scoping study on, on Brazil on this. With regard to, let's say, uh, comparing it directly with other renewable energy sources is obviously difficult, um, and also we don't want to actually go into a discussion whether wind is much better than biomass or the other way around. Compared to coal, for sure, I think, uh, especially if we meet sustainability requirements, we can for sure say that these overall chains are much more sustainable from an employment and an ecological point of view than, than fossil fuels. Um, is there anybody who would like to tackle the question about the status of Gobi gas? I was not there in May myself, so I don't know exactly what the status is. As far as I know, indeed, the first stage will not be continued, but I'm not sure if anybody else can comment on that. No. Okay. 
So I'm sorry. Not good. Not good. We have to fill that answer. And then perhaps the very last question for today before we close off, uh, what is the long-term outlook for wood chips? Again, not the main focus of our study. Um, would anybody of uh, the presenters like to take a stab at this one? No. If not, I, I could only say, let's say, we, we see wood chip use mainly for residential District heating for, for a small and medium scale plants. I am actually one of our members, Holfar. They are building a very large uh, plant uh, in the Copenhagen area for the production of district heating. And so there, the use of wood chips and especially also imported wood may still see some growth uh, because their transport distances are still fairly short. Transport can occur over the Baltic Sea. And basically, wood chips, even though they contain a lot of water, if that water is condensed again, then the, water, the heat is recovered, and then this is not a big issue. This could be a, a minor growth market. Um, but overall, I think um, I would be surprised if we'd see a massive increase and in, in trade of wood chips in the, in the near future in, in the EU. I think with that, we have to bring this uh, webinar to an end. We are a bit over time already, so I would like to thank all participants and the presenters for their contributions. As Luke Kaufmann pointed out already, the entire webinar, including the slides, but also all commentary, will be available on iabarng.com slash iapublications slash webinars. So hopefully within the coming days, this entire webinar will be posted. You can also find other webinars um, uh, about other topics uh, on the same website. So again, we would like to thank everybody for joining the call, also putting a lot of interesting questions. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to also see you next time uh, at the next webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>